you, Lisa, and thank you, Curve Beam and Foot Innovate for having me this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about my first six months with weight bearing CT and uh, coming up with a title for this talk. I felt it appropriate to to name it Seeing 2020. So at the end of uh, the year, this is uh, my family with, with Santa Claus in our matching uh, pajamas here, and uh, just to get an idea of, of who I am here. Um, certainly, weight-bearing CT scanning has been on the forefront uh, in the last several years, and it's gotten a lot more attention, and we're seeing more and more publications about the utilization of weight-bearing CT scans in order to assess foot and ankle pathology. And uh, so I think everybody's aware that it's out there, but I think a, a lot of people have this question, you know, does weight-bearing CT scanning make sense for my practice? And that's what the tonight's lecture is really about. Um, to give you a sense for that, I'd first like to give you a sense of, of me and my practice. I'm down in Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, and I'm part of Atlantic Orthopedic Specialists, which is a private practice orthopedic group. We have 21 orthopedic surgeons in my group, uh, two foot and ankle surgeons, uh, uh, fellowship trained foot and ankle surgeons, and then uh, three hand and upper extremity surgeons. Um, Virginia uh, is a certificate of need state, uh, meaning that you have to apply to the state in order to uh, have a uh, license granted in order to have an advanced imaging modality like MRI or CT scanning. And so we had to go through an application process in order to get uh, and obtain the CT scanner that we're currently using. We started that application process at the end of 2018. And then the certificate of need was approved uh, in March of 2019, uh, just this past year. So uh, this is how I felt, sort of like my kid looking at Santa, uh, when we finally got our CT scanner um, and we scanned our first patient. So uh, this is my patient uh, getting his, the very first uh, CT scan that we did in our group. Uh, we have a curved beam lineup unit. We installed it in one of our office locations. Uh, one of the uh, issues with our uh, practice and the way it's set up is that we're, you know, such a large group. We have 21 orthopedic surgeons. We're sort of spread out a lot along a large geographic area, and so we have five office locations. And we ultimately had to uh, select one area to put the put the machine uh, and and house it. Um, you can see the unit on the right hand side there. Uh, the uh, used to be an office. Uh, exam room that we uh, then lined uh, with lead. Uh, and then converted uh, in order to uh, perform the CT scans in the office. If I could do it all over again, I would have put the unit on a truck so that we could have moved it uh, from office to office. But the uh, experience for the patients is first class. They're able to walk right into the room, have the CT scan done. It takes about 25 seconds to do the CT scan, and the radiation exposure is very minimal, uh, 3.2 microsieverts. To give uh, some uh, comparison, uh, that's basically, you know, three hours of, of, uh, uh, of exposure to uh, natural sunlight and natural radiation uh, for the knee and about nine hours for uh, the foot and ankle. Um, it's uh, about half of what the uh, PEDCAT, which was the pre previous unit from Curve Beam, uh, is in terms of radiation. So it certainly cuts down on that. The technique for that is that the uh, radiation is, is pulsed out. It's not constant as the, uh, the machine spins uh, so that the radiation is, is really much lower. So this is how the unit looks like, uh, looks like uh, when it's lit up uh, and the patients and the office staff is always, are always snapping pictures of it and sending it to me. Uh, so they're, they think it looks cool too. So it is a beautiful machine, but what can it do for you and, and in your practice? Uh, this is a... Uh, rendering of, of the coronal sagittal and axial cuts that you get um, standard. Uh, and you can see uh, feathering through that. So you're able to look at uh, both the right and left sides in really high detail um, with the patient, most importantly, in a weight-bearing position. So um, that you're able to see the dynamic forces of the patient's body weight um, on the anatomy of the foot. Um, and in addition to that, you can also do 3D rendering. So this is a patient of mine, a ballerina, uh, with posterior ankle impingement and symptomatic ostrigonum that uh, we were able to CT uh, with her up on point in her point shoes uh, to really see where she was impinging and having symptoms. And so this is really kind of the, the kind of thing that you can't do with conventional imaging. 
Um, you can you can do this with uh, you know standing radiographs, but not with the fine detail, and certainly not with the 3D reconstructions that you get with the uh, weight bearing CT scan technology. Um, in addition, you can image both sides simultaneously, which is a, a major advantage. Um, and you can put the foot into any position uh, for the imaging study. One of the other advantages that you'll get, in addition to the 3D renderings, is that uh, you can uh, get multiple X-ray views and specialty views that sometimes uh, radiation techs that you have in the office may not be uh, necessarily proficient in. So, um, in addition to uh, getting the CT scan, you can also get specialty X-rays, so a calcaneal a PA view, a Saltzman view, uh, a sesamoid view, um, and then the standard AP lateral and oblique x-rays. Um, so the Saltzman view in particular is, is often very hard for even experienced x-ray technicians to, to get that in the office, uh, but I found that this is really helpful, particularly with preoperative planning and uh, patients that are going to undergo subtalar arthrodesis in order to correct that hind foot alignment. Um, and uh, the image quality is phenomenal there. The other, uh, you know, an interesting image that you often get that, you know, I, I didn't really utilize until we had access to weight-bearing CT scan is getting this uh, uh, pedoscopic view, which is off, which is very similar to a pedobarograph, where you can really see the distribution of weight along the plantar aspect of the foot, and that can sort of help you guide uh, your treatment in terms of if, if patients are having medial or lateral column overload, uh, correcting that. Uh, so here are the, the 3D uh, rending. This is a patient with a uh, unilateral uh, severe flat foot deformity, and you can see the significant uh, subfibular impingement, the eversion of the hind foot, um, the medial escape of the talus, and the uh, medial uh, subluxation of the tail navicular joint, uh, and the animations that you can create and, and render uh, with the uh, imaging uh, technology here is, is phenomenal, and really see the difference compared to the contralateral side to the affected side, um, and as well look at the uh, contribution of physiologic weight bearing to the overall deformity of the foot. Um, one of the other features that, that's really nice is that you can subtract out to the level of the skin, and you really almost get a picture of the foot. And so, you know, you can get a lot of physical exam findings uh, that you can't get with plain imaging with this 3D rendering technology. So you can really see the eversion through the hind foot, the too many toes sign, um, and all the other classic uh, physical exam findings that we see with these severe uh, flat foot deformities. And then you can marry the two together uh, and, and see the overall alignment changes, see the normal side, uh, and then that can help you visualize in the operating room um, especially when the other extremity is draped out, you know, where you need to get back to in order to get to this patient's neutral alignment and get them equal to their contralateral side. Uh, using that same technique, you can, of course, freeze that animation at any point. Uh, you can uh, rotate this uh, any number of uh, positions, and, and uh, here we have a 3D rendering of a hind foot alignment view, and you can see on the fibula, how it's really in, impaled onto the uh, and into the uh, calcaneus and the lateral aspect of that posterior facet of the subtalar joint, and how the uh, the subtalar joint really has no uh, congruity at all uh, with the talus, except for on the very medial aspect of that uh, posterior facet. So the weight bearing CT scan is not only useful for those severe deformities, but you can also see uh, the more subtle. Uh, subfibular impingement you can see in this uh, image on the left, and then uh, certainly the more significant and severe uh, aspects of the subfibular impingement that you see on the uh, right side images uh, bilaterally. In addition, uh, you can really get an understanding, uh, and this is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis of mine that has a similar problem with uh, subfibular impingement and eversion through the hind foot, but you can see that the, the issue is really through the ankle joint where the deltoid ligaments failed. Uh, and the lateral aspect of the ankle joint is eroded. Uh, in addition, you can see the uh, fibular stress fracture that's been created from this, you know, pseudo-articulation between the calcaneus and the fibula. Um, one of the other things and I found very interesting in my first uh, uses of uh, weight-bearing CT scan technology was looking at bunions, surprisingly. 
So I think everybody's had the experience of uh, looking at some x-rays of a bunion uh, prior to walking into the exam room and measuring out the IMA and having some type of expectation of what you're going to see when you walk into the room. And uh, especially early in, in my first couple years of practice and through residency and fellowship, you know, an IMA of 13 was felt to be, you know, sort of mild to moderate and certainly amenable in, in most cases to a distal metatarsal osteotomy. Where an IMA greater than that, I was uh, more prone to doing either a proximal osteotomy or lapidus type procedure. So um, looking at this patient's bunion, uh, you can see that, you know, it looks a little more severe than you might expect based on the initial imaging. And, you know, I always kind of just shrugged at that initially and, and sort of said, well, that's just kind of how bunions are. You know, sometimes you, they don't look bad on an x-ray, but you walk in the room and they look a lot worse. Um, with the 3D rendering, uh, again, you can get an idea of just the, the size and the um, significance of the bunion and the, the subtle hammer toe that you can see on the uh, left foot there that uh, may not be as apparent on plain imaging. So the first thing that, that comes in handy when you're looking at these bunion deformities is certainly the sesamoid rotation and translation. And so you can see on the normal right side that there's a well-established cristae and that the tibial and fibular sesamoids are sitting within the groove. On the left side, you can see that um, there's been perhaps even some erosion of the cristae and that the uh, sesamoids are translated laterally and that there's a rotation of the metatarsal head compared to the contralateral side. One of the other interesting things is, is really getting a good idea of what's going on with the intrametatarsal angle. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, and this is something that I'm interested in, in studying and researching a bit more, but um, on the left-hand side, when you're measuring the IMA from top down, you're really not taking out the slope of the metatarsals in relation to the floor. And so certainly that slope is a lot higher in patients with cable varus feet, uh, and it's, it's probably more accurate in patients that are flat-footed. But on the right-hand side, what I'm doing is uh, doing a rotation at the axis of the metatarsal at the first metatarsal cuneiform joint. So they're really looking right down the barrel of the uh, first and second metatarsals when we're measuring that IMA. And so when we do that and we compare the intrametatarsal angle on the left-hand side, uh, and we measure, again, preoperatively before I walked in the room, 13.1 on the plain x-ray, and you compare that, uh, to what we measure on weight-bearing CT scan after correcting for that uh, sagittal plane, you can see that the, there's a pretty significant difference, and what we actually measure is about 16. Um, so I'm sure that there's, uh, you know, intra uh, and inter uh, uh, observer changes that you can see, but um, that's a pretty significant difference of, of three degrees, and certainly I'm going to be less prone to doing a distal type of osteotomy uh, with that amount of rotation, and that also uh, the increased IMA of about 16. So uh, for this patient, did a proximal correction, um, corrected the rotation of the metatarsal, and uh, did a lapidus uh, type procedure with the fusion of the first metatarsal cuneiform joint in order to correct that. And so you can see that the, when you take that into, into uh, consideration that the uh, correction is, is more reliable and hopefully longer lasting. Um, so in addition to that, uh, certainly, you know, everybody's familiar with the different uses of, of CT scan uh, technology in, in terms of uh, evaluating fractures, but uh, really you can see the impact of this uh, calcaneus fracture and the lateral wall blowout um, and, and get a better idea of the involvement of the posterior facet. Um, evaluate fracture healing in this patient with uh, bilateral talus fractures before uh, going on to remove hardware. At, um, Evaluation of arthrodesis. This is a patient that had a uh, revision uh, first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint arthrodesis that had a distraction with calcaneal uh, autograph for a prior nonunion, um, and uh, eventually had taken her hardware out uh, because it was bothering her, and she has arthritis on her other side. We got a CT scan here, and you can uh, see how nicely that uh, first metatarsal phalangeal joint fused up, and you can see the incorporation of the allograft and how we got some length back there. Uh, another patient with incorporation of a trabecular metal wedge uh, for a distraction subtalar joint arthrodesis for a prior calcaneus fracture with uh, loss of height and uh, arthritis of the uh, subtalar joint. Um, speaking of arthritis, uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to see uh, arthritis, uh, especially of, of different midfoot regions, and particularly with uh, plain imaging. And while you'd argue that you would see these same changes uh, on 
uh, conventional CT scan imaging, you certainly uh, get a better appreciation for the involvement, uh, especially of that uh, navicular cuneiform joint um, with uh, weight bearing imaging and how that carries over to the second and third uh, TMT joints. Um, another uh, good application of, of this technology is looking at uh, total ankle arthroplasty. And so you can see uh, on the uh, left side, there may be some suggestion of, of early loosening around the, the tibia on plain imaging. Uh, but on CT scan, you can get an idea that, that uh, the cystic changes there are maybe a more significant and may need bone grafting. Uh, evaluation of osteochondral lesions of the talus. Uh, and now uh, I usually get, in addition to an MRI, a CT scan uh, for most of the osteochondral lesions that I treat in order to really get a true idea of the size. I think MRI really overestimates the size of these osteochondral lesions and you need to know how, what the cystic component of that is in order to uh, preoperatively plan for these appropriately. I think weight-bearing CT scan is going to be the gold standard for evaluation of syndesmosis postoperatively. Uh, here you can see that, you know, initially on plain x-ray, you would think you probably got a pretty good reduction in the syndesmosis, but uh, it's almost two millimeters wider on the uh, affected side in the postoperative side compared to the contralateral side. Um, I think uh, getting simultaneous bilateral weight-bearing CT scans has tremendous advantage, uh, particularly with evaluation of the contralateral side. And then seeing that physiologic load on the syndesmosis. Uh, syndesmosis being a joint does change with the foot position, uh, weight-bearing, um, and so I think that uh, getting these images weight bearing is, is critical. Um, I think pre-op templating for total ankle arthroplasty, which is uh, just now starting uh, with the curved beam lineup, is, is going to uh, be uh, a game changer. Um, looking at uh, complex deformity and uh, correcting that with patient-specific cut guides, uh, I think increases the reliability and reproducibility of the procedure. In addition, I think we're just starting to understand the, the role that rotation plays in terms of placing these implants. You know, when we, uh, when the engineers look at the pre-op templating and make the plans, they really base the rotation off the tibia. Um, and I think that that tailor rotation is sometimes difficult to figure out in terms of where that tailor implant should be rotated. Um, when the templating is currently done, the contralateral affected side is, is really subtracted immediately. I think that there's a lot of critical information that can be gained looking at the normal rotational axis of the uh, unaffected uh, tibio tailor joint and using that to template out the new ankle replacement that we're going to see uh, going forward. Uh, with the lineup unit, not only do you get, obviously, the foot and ankle imaging, but you can also obtain imaging of the knee, hand, wrist, and elbow. Um, and so I have three uh, hand uh, partners in my practice, and they're doing a fair number of uh, wrist uh, and elbow CT scans, mostly for uh, post-traumatic uh, issues and evaluating for scaphoid fractures, but also looking at post-op uh, fusions. Um, bilateral imaging, I'm just going to show a case here where you know bilateral imaging is critical. You can get an idea of what's going on on the plane films. Uh, with this uh, Liz Frank injury on uh, bilateral weight-bearing x-rays in the office, but getting bilateral CT scan, you can see that not only is there widening of the uh, inner space, but there's also some subtle intercaneiform instability that you may not appreciate on uh, just the plain x-rays. And so using that, you can go ahead and address that uh, and not fuse uh, or fix any unaffected joints. So in the uh, preoperative CT scan, the first metatarsal caneiform joint really unaffected and uh, reproduced uh, on intraoperative stress examination. And so just, you know, really treating the, uh, the, the uh, what you need to treat and, and leaving what's normal alone. Um, looking at some of the financial impact of the, uh, the CT scanner, I know I have 21 partners in my group. I really have five people that uh, benefit uh, from it clinically, but the other guys are, are all interested in, in uh, how its effect on the group. And so, I looked at our first 150 scans, and the average reimbursement per patient was about $266, with a range of about $750 to $50, uh, which broke down to about $39,000 in the first three months uh, utilizing the scanner. Um, in order to break even with the CT scanner, it's about 11 or 12 CT scans a month, and currently we're doing about 30 to 40 in our group uh, monthly, and 90% of that's foot and ankle. 
Um, I'm going to close with this uh, case uh, that you guys might find interesting. Uh, as a patient with uh, brachymetatarsia, 17-year-old female with uh, painful bunion deformity and then congenital shortened metatarsals. Uh, she has Turner syndrome. She'd failed about a year of non-operative management. She's uh, now skeletally mature, uh, but her deformity is progressively worsening and she's having more symptoms. So uh, here you can see the significant deformity that she has, uh, the involvement of the uh, second metatarsal phalangeal joint and the lateral deviation there with the congenital shortening of the third and fourth metatarsal. You can see the uh, sort of disuse osteopenia of the distal aspects of that third and fourth metatarsal and the uh, um, deformity of the uh, first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint as well. Uh, good news is she has the same problem on the other side. So weight-bearing CT scan, you get a, a better idea of what's going on in terms of the overall alignment of the foot. Uh, the relationship uh, on that right side, uh, the uh, four or five uh, TMT area, but really it's the uh, 3D imaging um, and the uh, really the clinical exam that that helps uh, guide what to do with this case. So you can see that not only are those metatarsals shortened, but then also the metatarsal phalangeal joints at three and four are uh, uh, dorsally displaced. And so really the deformity correction needs to be triplanar uh, in order to uh, lengthen the third and fourth metatarsals, but then also bring down uh, and then realign the metatarsal phalangeal joint at that location. So uh, based on that uh, plan, I like to do an acute correction of the uh, first and second uh, metatarsal phalangeal joints with the uh, bunion correction and then uh, soft tissue procedures for the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, and then gradual lengthening of the third and fourth metatarsals with uh, pinning of the uh, DIP, PIP, and MTP joints of uh, three and four. Um, here you can see uh, after the external fixer has been applied and gradual distraction uh, has been uh, performed, the uh, third metatarsal has been lengthened about uh, 16 and a half millimeters, and the fourth has been uh, lengthened a little bit less than that because she was having more pain, so we had her doing half turns on that side, but um, she's uh, about six weeks out from surgery now, and this is the clinical appearance of the foot, uh, certainly much more normal uh, uh, cosmetically, and then also symptomatically, we've brought the metatarsal heads down to be in line, so there's no overload of that second metatarsal phalangeal joint, and then the risk of recurrence of the bunion deformity is lower with the border to just being appropriately positioned. Um, so weight-bearing CT scan has been the most important addition of my practice since I started. Uh, it's, I think it's greatly enhanced the level of care and the sophistication of care that I'm able to provide for patients. Uh, it's been financially positive for the group uh, so far, and uh, I'm very excited about it. If I had one recommendation, it would, if, it would be that if you're in multiple locations like I am, I'd put it on a truck so that you can easily move it from, from place to place. But thank you very much.